Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collins Guitars and Mandolins, each and every one built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If you want to improve your playing, join me and thousands of other pickers getting better every day at pegheadnation.com. Hi, this is Matt, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who loves bluegrass. Welcome back to Bluegrass Jam Along. This is a very special episode of the podcast. My guest this week is Brian Sutton, and we are having a conversation to raise money for the IBMA Trust Fund to help people who are suffering the devastating after effects of Hurricane Helene. Um, I chatted to Brian about this a few weeks ago because Brian is from Asheville, which is one of the places hit hardest by the hurricane, um, and that area means a lot to him. And I just floated the idea of doing an episode and asking for donations for people to be able to put questions to Brian. Um, And he immediately said yes, which was wonderful. Um, And so thank you so much to Brian for doing this. Um, Everybody who's asked a question has donated. There is a link in the show notes. Please, if you're listening to this and you haven't donated and you feel you can, any amount is wonderful, but please do go and donate. There's a link in the show notes. Uh, Fear not, I will be mentioning this several more times through the episode um, to give you plenty of chances to go and do that. Uh, Yeah, we've raised... A few thousand dollars so far, and I'm very keen to get a bit more. I'm going to leave this up for a while. So if you listen to this and you think, oh, I've missed my chance to donate, go and click on that link in the show notes and see if it's still open, because it probably will be um, if you're listening within the first couple of weeks. Um, And we would love your donations, because as we talk about in the episode, it's not just how this affected people for a short period of time. This is affecting people, homes, livelihoods, communities, um, services, all sorts of things, and will be doing for you know months and potentially years in some cases to come. Um, so it's a very worthy cause. I really want to thank Brian for his time on this one. Um, I also want to thank the team at IBMA. Um, I particularly want to thank Elizabeth Dewey, uh, Anna Klein, and Ken White, but the whole team there, everybody's been very supportive, um, and thank you for your help. Um, I also want to thank... Patricia and David from Artist Works, who gave us a very generous donation and and helped get this together. Um, thank you guys for that. But I'd also like to thank everybody who's donated. And I said when we took donations, I would mention people. So I'm going to mention them now, because if I do a list at the end, I know you're not going to listen to it. And this stuff is important. Thank you for your donations, in no particular order, to Tim Burns, uh, Greg Clyburn, Marguerite Gravoir, Warren St. John, Chapman Welsh, Ivan Wolf, Maria Wallace... Rodney Gregory, Rick Nielsen, Claire Armbruster, Paul Kelly, Terry Bradley, Brandon Ray, Jesse McGee, David Whitesell, James Panek, Yukari Kilbride, Luke Taylor, Nicholas Petica, Timothy Park, David Cross, Zeb Snyder, Matthew Wyman, Ed Fortuna, Elijah Mayfield, Diane Austin, Dita Duncan, Ben Isaacs, Jacqueline Bastek, um, as I said, Patricia and David from Artist Works, and Dan Garcia. Thank you so much. Um, we really, really appreciate this. Um, but that is it. I am going to let you listen to Brian Sutton chatting to me about all this stuff. Um, Please click on the link in the show notes and go and donate if you can. Or if you've donated to other fundraisers, share the episode with friends. Do something to help spread the word and we would very much appreciate it. Um, We will be back with more regular interviews in the coming weeks and there's some really exciting stuff coming up so do stay tuned. There's Sierra Hull on the way, Sarah Juros on the way, some other great stuff. But first, here is Brian Sutton talking about... The effects of Hurricane Helene, and then an interview entirely made up of questions put to him by Bluegrass Jam Along listeners. So thank you, everybody. Um, everybody who's asked a question will get a mention in the episode, so don't worry if you haven't heard your name yet and you asked a question. Um, that's it. Here comes Brian. Thank you so much. <laughs> My 
My guest on Bluegrass Jam Along this week is Brian Sutton, who, uh, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, will have heard on this podcast a few times, as he was one of my very first guests, and also came back to chat about Doc Watson and Tony Rice. And if you've listened to this podcast at all, you'll have heard him because he does the theme tune. Um, Brian, it's great to see you. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Nice to see you. Um, I wish we were talking under slightly happier circumstances than this, but I think it's uh, it's a great chance to have a conversation about this and to encourage people to help because I think the news cycle moves on so quickly. There's a lot going on in the world, and it's just good to remind people that there are people out there suffering still. Um, right. And and this is something that affects a, a part of the nation that is very, very dear to your heart because you grew up in Asheville, didn't you? Yes, yeah, right. And that Malcolm County area was... Uh all my sort of formative years. Yes. And the people that you, that you know, there, the people that are still there is, is are people okay? Are the people still really sort of suffering with this? I was just there this past weekend. Um, and as far as my immediate family, my parents, my sister, brother-in-law, my wife's parents and her sister and brother-in-law, everyone is fine. Um, the hardest thing that they specifically had to deal with was just the lack of water uh, and other services that tend to come and go. But even now, you know, a month later where we sit today, you know, they have water, but they can't really use it. There's a boil uh, sort of order in place and, and a really suggestion just to use the water that you do see coming out of the sink just for, you know, flushing toilets and, and one thing or another, they're still, so they're still using bottled water for, for drinking. Um, so they're fortunate. And I feel like, again, I'm, as we sit here today, a month after the uh, event, the hurricane went through there, uh, there are still lots of people with lots of need, um, you know, and, and communities and towns wiped out that also, uh, you know, are, are, are full of, uh, you know, need uh, just to, sum it up uh one in, in one degree or another um but you know driving through there you see roads back open you see people out and about doing their thing um but you know you don't have to look far like literally we were driving past a, a little a kind of shopping center and people still in line to get food you know and and pick up lunches and um that's the thing about this particular storm in that area is that it's so widespread. It's not just one city like Asheville, but miles and miles north and south and, and especially west and east of Asheville, just so much devastation, uh, especially for communities that were along rivers, the French Broad River and the Pigeon River and any, you know, tributary or, or smaller creek connected to those rivers, just everything overflowed. And so as you drive around there, you can see the remnants of that just fields that are now kind of just, you know, as far as a month later, there's more dried dirt. And, you know, you see uh, along with the water damage was, um, you know, mudslides and tons of trees down. And so driving around there, you see, you know, where trees have basically just been cut to allow for people to drive through the roads, but they haven't really been cleaned up yet. I'm sure that'll all happen uh, in time and, and just, what's left of all the power lines and power, uh, uh, yeah, power lines and power poles that are still kind of lying on the side of the road. So it's, you can, at least when I was there just this last weekend, just a lot of aftershock. Um, but people are resilient and there's definitely a plan in place. Uh, but still, you know, just so much need. And, um, like I say, you see people getting back on their feet, but you also see people still, standing in line for water and doing laundry on the local soccer field where, where, uh, you know, portable stations have been set up. And, uh, you know, so the, the heartbreak of that is still there. And, and, and again, I guess the final statement is that the need is ongoing, which is again, kind of why we're doing this here today is, uh, just to help just this effort not go away with the news cycle. Like you say, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a part of the country that, it's mountainous, so a lot of places are still very remote, have to be accessed with helicopter or specialized sort of ATVs and, uh, you know, to the ongoing road building. You know, we're, we're, we are talking months to a year or more before things look anywhere close to normal. 
We'll be right back with you just after this. We'll be right back with you just after this. The long-awaited Hill Country series from Collins Guitars represents a new voice in their acoustic lineup. Rooted deep in the bluegrass world, these new Dreadnought NOM models feature a strong fundamental tone with a dry, warm and woody character that's sure to catch the attention of players who hold the vintage instruments of the 30s in their highest regard. Watch world-class pickers Jake Workman, Kenny Smith and Bob Minner perform with new Hill Country instruments on the Collins Guitars YouTube channel and learn more at collinsguitars.com. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. With 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music, Peghead Nation is something for every picker. You'll learn the tunes and techniques you need to join in at jams and play the music you love, plus advanced techniques like improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 per month and you can add more for $10 a month. Sign up for any course and get your first month free with the promo code JAMALONG, all one word. Join thousands of other players, including me, who are advancing on their instruments and having more fun playing the roots music they love at pegheadnation.com. Yeah, and so, like, with that in mind, obviously, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's donated towards this benefit yes. we're doing tonight to start with. But I will be leaving the fundraiser open because people will hear this episode when it goes out. People download the episodes afterwards. So we'll, we will leave it mm-hmm. open because... This is not a one evening thing. This is part of the, no. <laughs> part of the thing is just how much, you know, when when we're all starting our new years, there will be people still desperately waiting for help. They need to rebuild their lives and communities waiting to get back on track. So I think it's that long term thing is really key with things like this. And it's very easy to not see that unless you're there. Um, so yeah. thank you to everybody who's put some money up for this. I, we are both extraordinarily grateful. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to, if you're hearing this episode and you weren't aware we were doing this, just because we're doing this now and I'm asking Brian the questions I've collected, it doesn't mean you can't donate anything, however big, however small, it will all be very, very welcome. Um, but with that in mind, I would love to start asking you some of the questions people have sent in. Because sure. it's an interesting bunch of stuff. Um, the first one, I'm going to start with kind of practical practice type questions um marguerite Marguerite gravoir has been in touch and she said brian i've heard that you practiced eight hours every day to attain your level of skill on the guitar how much do you practice now thanks and keep up the good work um i don't practice much now and i haven't certainly in my professional career because i've been busy uh in one way or another either in studios or if i'm traveling uh, shows are generally long and they're sound checks and um, a lot of times there's rehearsals with the people I'm performing with but as far as individualized practice I have never in my professional career at least been one to set aside hours a day for that it tends to be the guitar is in my hand no matter what and I and I do sort of keep a general kind of awareness of where my playing is physically and 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 otherwise, and how things, how the improvisation is feeling. And um, a lot of the practice that I do to that point is really on stage because, I, again, I feel like I'm sort of an, more of an athlete interested in maintenance and interested in how the performance is, uh, you know, more forced or not, or does it feel comfortable and allowed, which speaks to some of the psychological side of things too. So, and it's really hard to practice performing. And it's hard to practice playing on a recording session, you know, when it comes to the red light on and I need to be <laughs> correct and right right now. Um, and so, again, that, that just, just sort of bolster the point of a lot of the practice and learning that I'm doing as a professional is the professional work that I do. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because like my son is learning to play music and he is learning to play football and all of these things and they practice skills. But as you say, that thing of yeah. practicing, putting those into context and into play in a moving environment is... If there is uh, something new to work on, it is, like you say, kind of working on that as the process is moving. And so if it's... Maybe I will sort of discover a new... I don't necessarily call it a lick, but just a, a, a potential kind of growth to my own personal vocabulary. So again, I have to sort of be conscious about that like I would be if I'm practicing some improvisation. But again, I have to be willing to try that out, you know, in the middle of a show. Uh, and so the, the, it's 
the risk of that is is uh, is daunting sometimes, but that's part of the process too. That's you know when I if I'm practicing to be a better performer, I'm practicing trust, I'm practicing risk, uh, that sort of thing. It's interesting because it leads on to another question from Maria Wallace, who was over here in the UK, mm. uh, and she's asked a question specific to kind of learning complex music. And she says this, she says, Hi, Brian and Matt. I went up to the Celtic Connections Festival in Glasgow earlier this year and saw Brian play as part of Baylor Flex Band. I wonder if he can tell us a little bit about the process of learning the Rhapsody in Bluegrass piece and how that works out, both for himself and for the ensemble. And that is some some complex music there. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was, you know, that was a lot to uh, to undertake. It started with me just becoming more familiar with the piece as it is, you know, in its traditional piano and orchestra form. Uh, Vela has also transcribed or the, the, I think the classical term is a reduction uh, of the original score, piano score uh, to the, uh, you know, transferred all that to the banjo. And that was all part of the project of, of sort of celebration of a hundred years of, of, of that piece of music and so as far as the blue grassification of that, he and I sat down and he already had some some ideas about what sections to highlight. Our our version of the Rhapsody in Blue, which is the Rhapsody in Bluegrass, is is not necessarily to the minute or to the to the bar, you know, uh, exactly what you would hear with a piano or orchestra. So uh, there are things added, there are sections that are left out just for one reason or another. To make it, you know, basically fit it into to his idea of what a bluegrass ensemble could do with that piece of music. So he and I sat down and, and I charted out and wrote out again several pages of, of what would be the main map of that. And from there, then it's just sort of back to traditional work of let's get together as a group and kind of carve through sections, little pieces. Uh, at a time, you know, as an ensemble, we would have recordings of that to be able to go and practice things on our own, you know, just iPhone recordings or whatever's in the room to just play along with. But, uh, but the real, you know, the real piece of it, the performance of it came together as, as that Bluegrass Heart ensemble with Sierra and Justin and Michael Cleveland and Mark Schatz and myself with Bela. Um, and even, you know, to the, uh, you know, after a few performances of it, just continuing to tweak things and just make sure um, some of the nuance, some of the minutia was still as, as tight and strong as it could be. Um, but, you know, so that was a process. And I can't remember exactly when we started that, but we did the initial recording in, um, I guess, sort of late summer of 2023. And so would have been rehearsing, practicing as a band for the weeks and months leading up to that recording. Um, and you know, the challenge was we sort of worked it up and then we had some time off over the holidays last year before, again, that tour that, uh, that she, that we're talking about here in, in, in uh, Glasgow. And so we sort of had to relearn it, which which actually helped, <laughs> you know, to kind of revisit it and, and know that you had some time apart from it. That's to me, that's where I felt like I really started feeling the piece where it wasn't just kind of a conscious effort to just not get lost and not make a mistake uh, was to actually feel like, OK, this this has lived in my brain and kind of uh, solidified enough to where once I put this back together, now it's, it's a little more automatic. So it was, you know. The, the process of it was was a long process and uh and the final performance of it i guess the last time we played it was at carnegie hall uh for sort of their celebration of this where bela played the original score or his version of the original score with the orchestra and we did our version um and uh you know it felt like a a project it felt like we sort of earned the through all the work you know earned that spot carnegie hall to play that piece of music it was very special and it's an interesting one because you, like, over the same period, were involved with the the kind of Copeland ballet score work with Gabe Witcher as well for Martha Graham yeah. Dance Company, which which I guess is is in the same ballpark, although intended to be performed to as well. So there's an an extra element to that. 
right? And that was more of a of an actual like bar to bar, like that could have been played with the original orchestra in in tandem. Uh, the the bluegrass heart version of Rhapsody in Blue was again kind of a standalone, dare we say, kind of tribute to the piece of music that is Rhapsody in Blue. But this, what Gabe did, was basically take the original score of Copeland uh, and uh, the Rodeo and basically figure out here's what the guitar should do, here's what the cello should do. Of course, the bass was kind of, I don't want to say easy, but a little more accessible. And then there's the banjo. And uh, and so that was Gabe's work. Amazing, amazing work to, to you know, in that way. And again, it was it was more traditional reading a score in real time as a, as a unit. Uh, with the Bela thing, there was a little more, it's kind of like a, a lot of his more complex music where there's complexities and things to remember, but there's some improvisation, there's some interplay uh, in real time where every performance would be different. This was, with with Gabe, again, more of a traditional faithful reading every time we played the piece of music. Um, and so that was, you know, I don't do that a lot. That was uh, the, the, the real challenge for me was to sort of, again, feel like a, a symphony player at that point or, you know, what we just call a reader. Um, no improvisation. Other than just, you know, more of here's the the emotion that we feel in this moment. But it was to the letter. Again, you're 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 working with a dance company who's relying on cues. And uh, the, the amazing thing that people didn't see in that was uh, we were down in the orchestra pit in all the performances. So and Gabe Witcher basically has a small monitor in front of him to kind of make sure that what we're playing is in sync because we can't see up on the stage. So he's got one monitor to, to look at them, direct us. He's also playing the violin part, counting us in, and also, by the way, playing a kick drum, uh, a bass drum in some of the sections that just needed that kind of percussion. And so to to, <laughs> to not get lost by just watching Gabe work was, was, was yet another challenge, but he did an amazing job. It is incredible sometimes. I've been to the opera quite a bit, and you see – particularly some of the older stuff, somebody will be leading the orchestra from the harpsichord for Mozart or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I could happily just sit for three hours and watch them do that without like a <laughs> single moment of what's going on on the stage. It's just, it's, it's oh, yeah. fascinating to watch that kind of stuff being coordinated. Yeah. And it was, you know, there's just the project of that and meeting with, um, you know, all the guys that played in that particular uh, ensemble and, and just rehearsals and, and, Again, just sort of like with the Bluegrass Heart project with, with, well, that whole, that whole experience, but certainly Rhapsody in Blue and, and this Copeland experience, just you, you do create a nice team and, and a kind of a community, small community within yourself because you're all kind of doing the same work and you're coming together and, and, um, you know, kind of sharing in the goal, sharing in the triumph, sharing in the, you know, oh, we, you know, we really dropped the ball on that one, uh, you know, that night or whatever it may be. But, you know, it's, it's, I like that about music anyway, being more of an ensemble form. Uh, I think that's one of the good things about it. Well, that sort of leads nicely into the next question, which comes from Dan Garcia, who has asked, what is your favorite musical memory so far, playing a show or backstage jam or seeing and hearing somebody for the first time or maybe something else? Wow. I mean, I could probably go through all those and, and, and define within each lane, boy, uh, a top shelf musical experience for me. Uh, one that I go back to a lot and just think, wow, I got to do that. Um, was on the stage at Telluride with, uh, Bobby McFerrin and Bela Fleck and Casey Dreesen. Uh, it was part of the Bela Fleck acoustic trio, but Bobby McFerrin sat in with us and, and he's just, such an amazing force of a, of a creative musical person and just a soulful, a soulful guy to be around. Um, I'll never forget that. Um, you know, for me, times that I got to be around Doc Watson, I will cherish forever and Tony Rice and Norman Blake, all like all the flat pick heroes, Dan Crary, um, The times with people and one of my favorite or sort of go to collection of memories as a studio player uh, have been when I get to just create a track with a singer. And I've been fortunate to be in situations like that where it's just a voice in my guitar with people. Again, like I've done a lot of playing with Dolly Parton like that. Amy Lou Harris, 
Johnny Mathis. <laughs> and, uh, I just, I just love that. And I hold those moments dear to me, you know, as far as just like that was so rewarding and, and to feel like it was, it was a duet, you know, I got to be a, a voice working with this other iconic voice. And I, uh, I love that so much. And it's funny that Dolly Parton bluegrass record that you made the first one, um, the grass is blue, I think turned mm-hmm. 25 years old, like two days ago or something. Um, and I <laughs> just keep going back to that record in particular. Um, it's just a, it's like, it's a really formative gateway into bluegrass for me, I think beyond being generally interested in bluegrass, but just hearing those songs performed with such kind of just energy and commitment and, just a just a thing. It was an extraordinary experience yeah. first hearing that record. Well, and to speak, continue to speak about singers and people like Dolly, and even in situations where it wasn't just me and the singer, uh, in some you know uh, either performance on stage or in a in a studio. When a singer like that starts singing, whatever the song is, it becomes their song. And I've I've been around other. Again, great voices that do that. Just the sound of their voice, the tone, the inflection, certainly the emotion. That that um, initiates so much. It clarifies so much about what my job is now. Um, you just you sort of hear it as a finished product, if you will, when they're singing. It's like I know what I need to do because that. That that such important part of this is so clear and so strong and so obvious that again it takes a lot of the guesswork out. Um, that's the you know it's one of those things that you wouldn't know if you if you weren't in that moment. But that's um, that's the way that feels. And again, it's it's happened thankfully for me in a few other situations where a singer and it's not just about powerhouse pipes and, and chops as a singer. It's about emotion. It's about somebody that really is willing and vulnerable to, to be risky and, and put all of what they have into a song. When you're, when I'm part of a band supporting that, then again, it clarifies a lot of things as far as what I should do or how I should do my part on the guitar, because you're just, you're a part of that commitment as well. They kind of lead, they, they lead you there. And I guess that taps in a little bit to what you said in the beginning about practice, really about, um, internalizing stuff to the point where you can use it and you can take mm-hmm. risks with it and you can go where the music needs to go rather than thinking, Oh, am I playing this arpeggio right or whatever? Yeah, you really, I mean, that's my role as a, as an uh, accompanist, accompanist is to trust everything that I need to do to be in that moment with whoever I'm supporting. And when I feel like I can do that, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I, I've done the work. I've, I've practiced <laughs> to be able to do that in a way that makes the moment what it needs to be. Uh, and especially in the studio when you're kind of capturing that. Um, again, I'm engaging in a lot of risk too, kind of improvising, if you will, in that sort of emotional space. I mean, I know exactly what the chords are, and we might have re- even rehearsed it a few times, but just to capture and really give in to an, emo- uh, an emotion or, or an emotive moment. And I've always looked, you know, like session players or character actors. So I'm doing a scene with this singer, especially the more emotional it is and risky and vulnerable it feels. I have to be willing to go there with my guitar. Yeah. So I can't get hung up on, you know, what the fingering needs to be or or anything like that. And it's amazing. And that's part of the lesson, I think, beyond lessons is getting out of your own way and truly trusting, truly being vulnerable in a moment and, uh, it gets kind of meta, but you do feel like, okay, my hands know what to do if I just allow that to happen. And I listen to the finished product versus, you know, fall into this trap of fear or uh, whatever it may be. Uh, it's amazing. Like the good things can happen when I trust. And that's the work you do <laughs> is to trust because it's not easy. Yeah. And that's the, the next question, as I was asking you, the last one felt very similar but actually talking about that that level of creating emotion and being in that moment and going with the emotion so the next question is from uh, nick petticoat who says can you remember the time you were most moved while performing mm. and at a performance wow. and that's yeah. an interesting one because in some ways your job is not to get so moved that you get lost 
but actually you need to be feeling the emotion to render it to other people. Yeah, I have definitely cried on stage. Um, one that comes to mind was the first time that I played Merle Fest with Ricky Skaggs. This is back 1997, maybe, or eight. Um, and I grew up going to that festival and, you know, I found myself on stage there and, you know, you just sort of well up with feeling that the, the tradition of one thing or another, you know, just the, the, the connection of that festival to Doc Watson and, and the, the music that I'd seen on that stage that I was now standing on. Uh, you know, there was, there was a pride there, not pride full or ego, like look at me, you know, but it was just, I don't know, it just, it was very thankful. Yeah. It was gratitude and thanks. Um, there was, Boy, yeah, I've had a few of those, you know, where just felt like what was captured was bigger than just some words and notes and, and whatever, but but a true emotion. Um, I did a I was I was recording that probably not many people have ever heard, and I don't even remember the name of the song, but there were and, and the singer wasn't somebody that people would know. But it was just, you know, kind of one of the sessions that I'm hired to do. But again, it was just one of these moments. It was just me and a vocalist. And it was a gospel tune. Uh, but just the way she was singing and, and it just felt, again, like I, what I was trying to say earlier, just we were riding this wave of dynamics and when things, you know, were building that we were together and, and just with the mood of the song and the, and the words and, and I mean, it's just, Again, that's where I go is that sort of tearful, like, wow, this is this is really, really heavy and happy to do it. Again, it's this blend of gratitude, weight, you know, the spirituality of, of whatever the, the moment may be. Um, and when I guess, yeah, when you feel like you've captured that or part of that, yeah, you are extremely thankful. So, I mean, I don't I can't go to the one, but uh, kind of like the other you know, favorite musical moments. I'm thankful that I have just memories and, and kind of collections of moments uh, in, in those spaces. Um, yeah. Well, there's seeing as you mentioned Melfest and you mentioned Doc a few minutes ago as well. Um, Claire Armbruster has asked, um, oh. <laughs> has said, can you tell us about your relationship with Doc Watson, how you, discovered him and later got to meet him and obviously talking about you know what we're talking about tonight um i think for me one of the most sort of moving images of all of the hurricane after effects like all the kind of down bridges and landslides and all of that but just seeing Mm -hmm. that statue of doc in boone as the sort of water cascaded past down the streets was i think for a lot of people was a really emotive moment so it'd be lovely if you could talk to us a little bit about doc Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, I got to see him play a few times. My parents would take me uh, where he would be playing live in our area around Western North Carolina. Um, Never necessarily in downtown Asheville, but there was another community just west of there called Maggie Valley. We saw him there and then there was a festival, kind of a more of a smaller family run festival in Union Grove, North Carolina. And I saw him there a few times. That was the first time I actually got to shake his hand. Um, but got to form more of a relationship with him once I joined the Ricky Skaggs band in the mid 1990s and um, would see him at Merle Fest or would see him out on the road. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I'm 20 something years old and he's Doc Watson and (laughs) I was always nervous around him and, and never really felt like that. I got a chance to just really say much other than just nice to see you. And maybe he doesn't know my name. Maybe he does. Uh, but again, as I started, even after the Skaggs band, still being around Merle Fest more as a artist or there with Hot Rise or Tim O'Brien or, or some other musical iteration to one degree to another and hanging out there for multiple days, then I would, you know, little by little get to just know him more and more. And, uh, and again, where he knew my name, knew me, knew my playing and, um, 
you know, I never really got to have like a long drawn out conversation with him, but the recording that we did for a duet, the duets record that I put out uh, almost 20 years ago, that was, that was a really great moment of just getting to hang with him, you know, cause we sat there for, you know, a couple of hours and had dinner the night before with my dad and, and Jack Lawrence and, and uh, his grandson, Richard. And, you know, so I felt like I got to, through all that time, formulate a connection just outside of here's another guitar player. Um, and that was, you know, when I look back at all the, you know, music is one thing, but but the person that he was and, and just feel like I got to know a little more of that. You know, that's the thing I like to say about him is that he did present this grandfatherly, kind, front porch, you know, uh, aesthetic from the stage. And, and that was very true. But he was, you know, as human as anybody he would get mad and, and was fiery. And, you know, you're not necessarily going to see that on the stage, but just really, you know, principled. I mean, one of the first times I did see him at that little festival, like he wasn't going to play a note of music until the sound was right. And, you know, it took him a while. And uh, when I look back at that, it's just I, I appreciate that. Like, he wasn't willing to do anything that was going to be as absolutely as pro or as high level as it could be. And um, I appreciate that so much about him. And just as I've worked with other people like T. Michael Coleman or Jack Lawrence or David Holt that have additional stories of, of you know, long drives with Doc and things that he would say and uh, – he, uh, you know, just got to sort of put any of those pieces together that uh, uh, that I might have missed, but still have a, uh, you know, I feel like I, I got to know him uh, through through those interactions. And, and uh, so I cherish all that um, beyond just the music that I got to play with him or, or you know, times on stage or whatever it may be. That's really cool. And I, it's funny hearing you talk about kind of that level of, sort of taking what he did seriously and having that sense of what the right way to do things. The flip side of that is I remember you, you saying about the phone call you had with him when you discovered you'd won a Grammy for that track and his kind of, <laughs> right. how kind of lighthearted his response to it was, you know, I think what would you, yeah, we fooled it. We fooled him again. <laughs> so, you know, there's a beautiful thing about that, about, um, you know, the sort of hard and fast, no, this has to be done right. And at the same time, holding yeah. it all very lightly once it's been done. It's a beautiful combination. Yeah, it's it's moving on. It's it's that sort of personality trait where yeah, we'll celebrate the win, but we're not going to allow ourselves to to get too haughty about this or you know define too much of ourselves based on you know somebody else saying okay this is good we'll give you a trophy. So there was that that self-effacing, but also like yeah let's okay that was fun let's move on and do something else and yeah that was that was definitely all kind of wrapped up in that. Uh, and that's been a lesson from, you know, Doc and other musicians that have been around that as I, as I just sort of watch and, and observe uh, and learn. Well, as we're talking about Doc and Boone, and we've been mentioning that neck of the woods, let's just pause for a minute to remind people why this episode is here in the first place. And there are people sure. throughout um, the Western North Carolina and into Eastern Tennessee who are desperately still needing help. Um, after the effects of the hurricane and that will go on for some time. So what we are doing with this episode is trying to raise some money to help now and moving forward. All the money raised by this episode will go to the IBMA Trust Fund to help people who are really suffering. Um, so please, if you're listening to this, do take a second to go to the link in the show notes and donate whatever you feel you can. We would be incredibly grateful for that and every bit of money that comes in will be helpful in some way that you will never even be able to imagine. Um, and thank you in advance for the people who take the time to go and do that. We do really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one person, two people who have very generously donated to this are Patricia and David at Artist Works. And Brian, you, oh, yeah. you have a long standing relationship with Artist Works. Um, and so Patricia and David very generously put a, a large chunk of money into this. And so I said, well, why don't you ask some of the Artist Works students what they would la like to ask Brian? And one of the joys of Artist Works is that you get to interact with high-level musicians and, act and actually ask them these questions. But a few people had some questions that they wanted me to put to you, um, which is great. Um, and one, some of them are, are very straightforward. 
One comes in from Justin who asked what your live method and gear for playing live is. Do you use pedal to boost before a break or do you just play dynamically? Yeah, it's the current rig. <laughs> it's one of these things that's, that's morphed and changed over the years. Uh, the current setup is a guitar that I have that has an internal microphone and uh, a bag's lyric pickup. And the signal gets blended in a, uh, a preamp made by the fine folks at Grace called a Felix. And through that preamp, I can, you know, set balances of those two signals, EQ. Um, and, yes, there's a boost for solos when I remember to turn it on. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and a mute, which sometimes I also, in the, in the fervor of trying to remember to boost, I will actually mute myself into a solo. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, yeah, the intent is to boost for solos and then um, – push that same button again, which brings me back down to the level that I started for solos. Yeah. Um, and usually this means that I am not on a microphone. So the value of that, you know, if I were on a microphone, I would stand farther off the microphone and then move closer to the microphone for solos where again, it's a, sort of the choreography of a, of a live acoustic band. You're, you're mixing yourself that way. So the boost allows you to have that sort of dynamic control. Yeah, it's funny when people are playing all plugged in. Sometimes as an audience member, I love it when people play on mics because whoever's about to step up, you know they're about to take a break and it helps you visually right. see the music being passed around and yeah. there's something beautiful like that. Um, we've had another technical question um, from somebody called Chalmers. And I love this one. Uh, it's this, oh, yeah. is, this is detail. I like this very much. As a studio player, how in the world does Brian not get clacking noise from his fingernails on the pit guard? Um do you, does he use fake or natural nails? I'm asking because I mimic his technique and have fake nails, and there seems to be no way to adjust my technique to get rid of the noise, which obviously can't be tolerated in a studio setting. Mm -hmm. And what we're referring to here is the sort of the, the technique of brushing the pick guard with a couple of fingers to keep your right. hand oriented for people who haven't seen that. Right. Yeah, it's uh yeah, we're down in the in the depths of it, which is great. And it is a real issue when you're in front of not just, you know, expensive microphones, but that are run through expensive gear and EQ and compressors. And, uh, and it is a microscope to a degree and, and every little thing is bigger than it would be if you were just sitting in a room. So yeah, the point is, is that I use my natural nails. Uh, I've tried the acrylics some years ago, uh, but just one, they felt weird on the strings and two, yes, it was a little more of a conscious effort to try to avoid noise there's something about more of my natural nails that just as i've done this for the year over the years uh it's a little more manageable and really for chalmers that's you know uh and any other any uh, any other player looking for sort of more right hand or picking hand technical awareness you know for me the adjustment or the adaptation there is not pushing against the pit guard to, pre to prevent motion, but, but gliding along. Um, so I'm always in contact. And so that means there's no lift and replant. The clacking comes from a lift and a replant. So the sweet spot for me is, is tension management, being as open and flexible as I can be in any given moment, but also not lifting and replanting because that, that connection, you know, the clapping or the clacking of the nails or anything against the guitar you know, it's going to be heard. So minimizing that motion uh, away from the instrument and back uh, and back. That's that's the sweet spot. The, the elusive sweet spot is 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 that. And then the practice of that is, you know, within a, if I'm transitioning from more of a, you know, a, a strumming motion to, uh, you know, the reason I use the fingernails in the first place is more of the sort of arpeggiated playing, kind of like James Taylor or any other finger stylist. Uh, where I'm using a pick, a flat pick, and the and the nails of my ring and middle finger of my pick hand. Um, once those are engaged, you know they're usually more over the strings, um, and so if I, if I hear more of the clack, I'm probably doing something more with the with the pick. But again, that's where I'm gliding or in contact with with the pick guard or the instrument in some way, and not lifting and replanting yeah yeah that makes total sense um we've had another question from artist works which 
Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one as well because I know there are a lot of people um, who think about whether to play more than one instrument, whether to specialise. I know there are people who on multiple artist works courses at the same time. Um, and the question is, does mm-hmm. Ryan play any mandolin? Does he think that could be beneficial to learn more of as someone who plays guitar primarily? And I happen to know the answer to this because Brian plays the mandolin all over <laughs> the theme tunes of this podcast. Yeah. Um, and and sure. I remember when I interviewed you back in the, whenever it was, two, three years ago, um, initially for the podcast, you told me a story about getting a call for a session and the producer saying, mm. do you play mandolin? And your response to right. me in that interview as well, I owned a mandolin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was an owner. Uh, but but to say yes to a session was more important. So uh, at, at that point forward, I play the mandolin. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and it's banjo, at least, at least my work in Nashville on any given day in any given studio, uh, you'll find me with the host of acoustic guitars that do different things. But yes, a, a mandolin and a banjo are always part of my uh, pile of instruments. And I don't in any way claim to be a mandolin player at the level of some of the people that I've been able to play with, Sierra Hull, Sam Bush, Dominic Leslie, Casey Campbell, uh, and on and on. But I can get by. Uh, I am uh, I am capable. And I think to the session player part of those kind of instruments for me, I, I understand what to play in, in a lot of situations that I think even a lot of like bluegrass mandolin players might struggle with where maybe the song is a little more of a rock song and they're looking for like what, what kind of mandolin would you hear on a Rolling Stones record or, you know, some of the sort of more folky mandolin that, that you might have heard on the radio and in, in country or rock music in the 70s. Uh, and I, you know, so I've studied that kind of stuff too. It's not just about playing, uh, you know, Bill Monroe style or trying to play like Chris Thiele, uh, or anywhere in between. It's, it's a little more mandolin as a, as a, as a layering instrument in the music, a lot of the music that I work on. So I, again, I'm not really taking bluegrass solos and things like that. I can do that, but again, I, I'll certainly put the thing down, uh, in the interest of some other player that's, that specializes more in that. Um, and the same with a banjo. You know, sometimes I am playing the role of a banjo player, literally, uh, where, okay, we need to sort of nod to the fact that this is banjo-esque, but again, like a lot of full-time professional level <laughs> uh, studied banjo players might struggle with that because, you know, you, you have to sort of undo all those years of training to say, okay, all you really want me to do is just play this little line or two notes in, in time. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's fashioning the sound or the style of, of mandolin or banjo into whatever it is that I'm working on, which a lot of times, again, it's not going to be bluegrass. Um, but to just other musicians in our style learning, I can't say enough how important it is to, to, to be able to play other instruments. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that do orchestrations for symphonies uh, will play multiple instruments because it's important to know the range of the instrument. It's important to know, especially if you're writing or in a band, you know, to just be aware of what other what is possible on other instruments. Um, I think it's important to understand physically, like what somebody is going through on a banjo uh, or, or mandolin or, or fiddle for that matter, too. I mean, I played fiddle for a few years before I sobered up Mm. (laughs) and got rid of it. Um, But the point is, is that just a deeper understanding when I write songs, what's interesting sometimes too, I'll write something that uh, on a mandolin that I wouldn't write on the guitar just because my fingers and hands are so automatic. Uh, Maybe to a fault, you know, maybe it's just the guitaristic side of me is so ingrained that playing another instrument where that level of automaticity doesn't exist can actually reveal something musically that to me in that moment is a little more interesting because I wouldn't have thought of that on the guitar. Um, I would have thought of some, you know, more guitaristic thing to play. So, um, you know, I, I see value in it on all those fronts. Um, so, yeah. And that's really interesting sort of thinking particularly about the mandolin because if you were to ask the sort of general public about a mandolin and music and they're not sort of big bluegrass fans necessarily, they're going to say losing my religion they're going to say Cophead Road. Mm-hmm. They're going to say 
Maggie yeah. May, and none oh, of those are kind of the kind of things you traditionally hear played um, in bluegrass. So I think that's a really interesting point. And I've had so many people have said to me, you know, about writing on instruments that are not their primary. And like Jacob Jolliffe talked to me about writing his fresh grass commission on trying to write it on piano just to get away from where his fingers go sure. on the mandolin and trying to find yeah. trying to find pure melodies rather than pure mandolin melodies, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, it just speaks to when you've practiced something so much and it is so automatic and you recognize the potential limits of that, especially as a writer, when you're really trying to look at something fresh or something that is not just going to be part of some or even con- remotely connected to some phrase or phraseology or tendency that you might have just baked, literally baked into your experience on your primary instrument. Um, it also speaks to why I think it's always good for people to sing, uh, to be able to vocalize music where it's not under your fingers is important for a lot of reasons to understand more about the songs you're playing, understand more about the melodious potential of lines that you're playing in improvisation. Is it, is it sort of hyper technical and, and again, very mandolinistic or guitaristic? Um, you know, like a lot of the, the blue shape kind of stuff that you, we fall into on the guitar. Hmm. You know, not to say that that can't be melodic, but a lot of people, especially in bluegrass, tend to fall into these traps of very shape based playing and very kind of, uh, run lick based ultimately into ruts of just the same thing over, uh, over time. And I can tell you, you know, in a lot of the discussions we get in on artist works and, and it's just a real thing. I deal with it too, you know, where you're trying to undo or get out of these ruts where I just play the same kind of thing every time. So being able to vocalize, being able to go to another instrument, uh, to just break those habits and still feel musical, still feel like, you know, to those deeper degrees of what is melody, what is, um, what is a phrase? What, what is what is the tunefulness of, of your playing? Uh, I think all that is revealed more when you do get out of your own way uh, with your primary instrument. Yeah, and it's it's sort of talking about all that range of studio stuff, the versatility there. There's an interesting question um, from Ivan Wolf, and he said, since I'm one of those people who read liner notes on everything, I've noticed your name in the credits of several quite niche albums, such as a Nashville tribute band, which is a side project of Diamond Rio member Dan Truman, yet aimed at a very small niche market. I'm sure you've recorded for more projects than you can recall, but I'd love if you could talk about or mention any memorable or unique or particularly interesting projects you've played on. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, to some of the, that kind of uh, work, these sort of tribute records, um, uh, ones that I remember the most, uh, there was a guy, uh, Mark Thornton, who's still here in Nashville, has a studio. And for a while, early in my career here, he was doing records for this company called CMH. And they would do a lot of these picking on, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Nashville, player, Nashville players of whoever name. And a lot of times I would do those under a pseudonym just because their contract was a little, was more than brutal. Um because they would repackage things and you wouldn't get paid for anyway. That's not the point here. But what I remember about them is how fun they were. And the band was usually Dennis Crouch on bass. Uh, Kenny Malone would play drums and percussion. A lot of times Aubrey Haney would be playing fiddle. Um, and Mark was a good producer where it's like, okay, we need to get the main parts of the song in there, but we have so much freedom too. Uh, to just sort of play around with the grooves and just those were really fun sessions. And I don't remember the exact ones that we did, but there was like picking on Eric Clapton, picking on George Strait, maybe back in the day. Uh, these are all kind of maybe late nineties from CMH. Uh, and again, I did a lot of them <laughs> enough to where I can't remember all this, uh, all of them, but those are, those are really fun to do as far as other kind of niche things or things, you know, people might not or wouldn't expect to see me playing on Um, some of the things that I've done that um, there's a particular producer here who tends to uh, work with a lot of what are just called legacy artists. I mentioned Johnny Mathis earlier and you know, it's okay. Here's some famous record singer like that. And let's bring him to Nashville and do, uh, do sort of a country record. 
And so I have, uh, again, there's the Johnny Mathis. I think it's, what's it called? Let it, let it be me. Anyway, so it's Johnny Mathis's country record. And a lot of times these, these things don't really see a ton of the light of day, but they're out there and they're well thought, well thought out and they're fun to make. Um, we just did another one of these, uh, earlier this year with Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers. And that was really fun. Um, Michael Feinstein of, again, talking about Gershwin, he's sort of the American kind of keeper of the sort of Gershwin songbook and, and all this legacy and, and literal sort of museum pieces of the Gershwin estate and uh, is kind of a, again, kind of an, an American songbook purveyor like Marty Stewart is uh, with country mm-hmm. music, just collector, performer. Uh, and he came to Nashville a few years ago and started working on kind of a country Gershwin project that has a lot of big names on it, like Dolly Parton and Brad Paisley and Allison Krauss. Um, but again, that's a record that, that I don't think has really gotten to see a ton of, ton of the light of day. Uh, but there's some really good parts and, and again, a very thought out kind of record with a lot of, you know, top, top Nashville singers and producers and, and players. Um, I've gotten to make a few good records uh, with this, uh, the actress Kristen Chenoweth. Mm. Um, uh, she has a Christmas record that came out a couple of years ago. And um, yeah, so there's, you know, between the sort of bluegrass things that I might play on or the real commercial country, uh, as far as, you know, some of the other music that gets recorded in Nashville, you'll see a lot of things like that, like these sort of bigger you know, tributes or people that just are brought to Nashville or come to Nashville to do these, uh, do these projects. I've done a few records now with, uh, Rita Wilson, who's Tom Hanks wife, great singer, actress, uh, on her own right. Wonderful, wonderful person. It's been so good to hang around and just get to know her. But again, just, I'm, I'm doing anything but playing bluegrass guitar on these records, but, but I love doing that. I've always enjoyed playing a variety of styles and, and, I just, I, I like that. Uh, I like doing that. Well, it leads really nicely onto the next question, which is coming from Jesse saying, outside of playing guitar, what kind of music do you gravitate towards? Are there any artists or styles that would surprise people familiar with your work? Well, I've always been, again, not necessarily a schooled fan because there seems like there's so many sub genres, but the sort of general world of, of metal, of hard rock, heavy, heavy music. Um, started in high school with, you know, more of the commercial side with, with the bands that were popular in the late eighties, you know, from Van Halen, Aerosmith into other bands that weren't quite as on the radio, like Dokken and, um, and again, some of the guitar shred stuff, uh, from people like Mr. Big and, um, certainly players like Steve Vai, but getting into the sort of heavier side with Metallica back in the day, um, and continuing and one of the newer bands that I'm way into is, is called, they're called car bomb B O M B car bomb. And, uh, they do some amazing things as far as just manipulation of time and, and the way they use the instruments and things like that. And it's just such a, it's, it's a joy to listen to. <laughs> I always enjoy it. I love that kind of stuff. And it's so fun. I have my youngest daughter has gotten into that too. So we've gone to see Metallica, um, I wasn't in town for this, but she went to see Pantera a few months ago. And, uh, it's just fun to see, see that music live. Uh, Metallica is playing here in Nashville next year, a couple of nights at the stadium. Uh, and we're going to go to that. Uh, so that's, you know, I just, I love that. Uh, there's an energy there that I connect with. Uh, certainly the facility within the guitar playing is, is fascinating to see in the rhythms. You know, like to just the, the sound of Metallica, you know, James Hetfield, their lead singer doesn't do the solos, but just he embodies so much of what is the ultimate kind of rhythmic soul of that band. Uh, it's, it's really, is, it really is amazing. It's so, I love that. I love listening to solo classical piano. There's just, that can take me to a place that I need to go sometimes. I've always been a fan of just, you know, again, like, uh, works with Beethoven and Schumann. And, uh, I feel like, you know, as a, as a musician that listens and obviously plays a lot of musician, uh, music as a pro, 
these are things that I don't play a lot or, or at all. And so to feel like I've got something that I can listen to that either I didn't play on or wouldn't ever play on or, and, and it's, I'm not saying it's foreign, but it's a way to, for me to enjoy music as a, as a fan of music that I don't have to overthink. I could just enjoy. And I think that that's the real connection there for me, uh, is I can listen just as a fan of music <laughs> and not somebody that's trying to unpack it or understand it too much. It's funny. I've experienced a tiny bit of that doing this podcast for the past three or four years because so much now of what I read about and listen to and, you know, is related to research for the podcast or putting stuff together or, and um, it is sometimes great just to stick my headphones on and get lost in something completely unrelated. And it's mm-hmm. amazing how many bluegrass guitarists seem to be fans of heavy music, like Billy Strings is an obvious example, but oh, yeah. Trey Hensley, huge Slayer fan. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I grew up listening to all that stuff. I, you know, I've seen Metallica live on more than one occasion. And, you know, that, that was yeah. my youth really was standing in theaters in the North of England while far too many bass drums hit my solar plexus with the amount of air they were shifting. <laughs> and it was just, yeah. it's something joyous about the energy of that kind of music that just. We're going to, uh, well, uh, well, when I first saw Metallica, that's what James Hetfield said. We're going to have fun. We're going to have fun with this. We're going to, you know, we're going to lift your spirits with metal. I mean, it wasn't this dark kind of satanic, you know, dirgy energy. I mean, you feel some of that in the songs, obviously, but, but I don't know. There's something palpable about it, something very physical, but again, it is connected to bluegrass in that way. That's it's physical, obviously as a music to play, if you're playing that music, but to listen to it, you know, when you see people bob their heads or dance to a fiddle tune, it's, you know, they, they bob their heads and shake their fists with a metal tune. It's just, and, it, and it's kind of cultural and tribal, if you will, as far as gathering as a group to do this and celebrate this sound and energy. You know, there's, it's, there are big and small similarities to that. I'll also throw in there too, uh, I'm, for the last, you know, I can't remember, maybe 10 years now, like vocal ensemble music, which again, it kind of falls into this. Like I would never find myself like on a session or, or be hired to do anything like this, but there, you know, there's a, there's an octet called Room Full of Teeth, and it's this really sort of uh, modern writing for for voice. And so it's not just oohs and ahs and words and, and, and harmony. It is that, but they do throat singing and whistling and, and spoken word and kind of guttural sounds that are written into these, again, kind of real modern pieces. And it's just amazing. It's just fascinating to kind of see it be done. Room Full of Teeth. <laughs> that sounds great. I have to go listen to that. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, and so that brings us on to the last of these questions from podcast listeners, which is related to that, actually. Uh, but it's a bit more specific mm-hmm. to the Bluegrass world, which is comes in from Terry Bradley, who says, who are you listening to these days when you have two seconds mm-hmm. to breathe? Who do you see as up and coming in flat picking on Bluegrass? Thank you. Wow. Um, I like... Well, I mean, I like a lot of players, but as far as somebody that's been impressing me more and more over the last um, couple of years is Zeb Snyder, who plays with the Appalachian Roadshow. Uh, he's always been great, but he's he's finding his voice more and more. Uh, and one of the advantages of Artist Works and now my uh, my camp there in, in Brevard, North Carolina, uh, is to see a few other players, singers, songwriters. Uh, there's a gal named Danielle Yoder, who's just such a kind of a complete package of singing, playing, writing. Um, it's exciting to see where her career is going to go. You can see her on Instagram or social media. Um, gosh, uh, I always, there's, it's one of those things where there's so, there's so many and it's hard for me to, in these moments to start individualizing. Um, of course, I mean, I'm like everybody else just to see Billy Strings continue to sort of evolve as a, as a force and as a musician is, uh, is really exciting. And Molly Tuttle as well. I got to sit in with her at the Ryman, uh, a few weeks ago, her first time to headline there. And, uh, I don't think it was a complete sellout, but she like came just, there's been a few seats of selling out the Ryman on her own. Uh, and that's so cool. I'm so, so happy for her. Um, yeah, gosh. Um, there's this kid that's uh, starting to make more waves kind of in the country world. I, I say kid. I, uh, I don't know how old he is, but his name is Zach Top. And um, 
you know, he comes from more of that sort of telly burning style, but, but comes out of the world of bluegrass and is starting to uh, certainly make a lot of waves here in Nashville and, um, you know, keeping that sort of traditional country uh, sound alive, you know. So when you, when you hear him play, you're going to hear, you know, kind of Tony Rice licks, but also Jerry Reed and kind of sort of the modern Brent Mason, Alan Jackson kinds of sounds and, and it's just exciting to see what, what he's doing. Yeah. Really cool. Um, I've got, I've got one question for you before we finish, but before sure. I ask you my question, I'm going to remind people that we're doing this because we are um, raising money for the IBMA trust fund to help people who have suffered the effects and devastation caused by the hurricane. And every little bit of money that comes in for this is going to be invaluable to somebody out there who is going through something that we can't even imagine. So if you have got anything you can spare, please go to the link in the show notes here. Um, and donate something i'm going to be leaving this open for some time after we put this episode out just to try and bring in a few more donations um i very much appreciate anything you donate brian very much appreciates anything you can donate um and thank you from the bottom of our hearts in advance for all those of you who do that um before we wrap up brian i would love to just to ask you what is next from you um well one of the things i mentioned earlier uh the the doc watson or the duets record that I did some years ago with Doc and Tony Rice and Earl Scruggs and George Shuffler and Norman, my dad, and, and, and a host of other players not too far from the tree. And I have been working over the last year or so um, on sort of a, a part two of that and some of the players that I've mentioned, you know, like Molly and Billy and Zeb Snyder. Uh, Jordan Tice. There's, I've just been collecting recordings, Cody Kilby, could go on and on um, of sort of duets with basically kind of a generation now after me. Um, I'm not, I'm not done with that yet, but that's been kind of an ongoing use of my energy as far as something that I would release. Uh, so it's still in process. There's, there's no literally no idea of when anything would be out available to the public at this point, but it's been fun to uh, kind of revisit some of that, just concept and, and how how I can do that in a way that feels like there's, you know, one of the things I liked about the first one or I was going for was, uh, you know, conversation um, and really, you know, not just sort of sharing a fiddle tune, but having having a conversation with the guitars through the uh, through the sound of flat picking and this kind of music. So that's it's been fun to think about the different musicians that are involved and what I can do that feels unique to that relationship. And, and again, that's one of the, the beautiful things about the world of bluegrass is it really is a community and, uh, and I enjoy sitting around talking to people. <laughs> and so it's sort of like, again, these, these recordings aren't just, let's see how fast or complex we can play. There's some fast complexities, but it's, it's more about we do this because that's how we would, what we would do anyway, or, or what I'm trying to say here is that, that's the relationship. That's uh, that's what it's it's what we sort of musically talk about or share or enjoy that kind of thing. So anyway, to not get too deep into that, it's uh, yeah, it's it's coming together. As far as you know, uh, any kind of travel, um, uh, the Bela Fleck project, you know, ended back in the spring, and I did a little more playing in the summer. But I I'm seeing a time in front of me that's kind of like I've always done where I'll sort of try to shift the balance a little back towards Nashville and being around home. And thankfully it seems like that that is revealing itself as such, you know, I literally don't have any shows or any travel for real booked uh, other than, uh, and depending on when people hear this November 14th of this year, I will be, you mentioned Boone, North Carolina, uh, doing a show there with the Appalachian road show uh, at the Appalachian theater. And, and so I can imagine that our, the theme of, of our show this year will certainly be more kind of like we're doing here, more on awareness and, and fundraising and, and, uh, again, just sort of bringing people together, try to, you know, as opposed to all the, the work and the, and the, uh, you know, the heaviness of, you know, putting a, a whole region of a, of a state back together in country, you know, just have a night of music and enjoy, enjoy the town. I know a lot of towns to, to add one more, statement to sort of our theme here of just raising money and awareness for that whole area is that, you know, even the towns like Boone that were affected by this, I mean, they are 
for intents and purposes, back up and going. And, and there is concern as I talk to the uh, folks that are putting the show on that, you know, they want, they want to make sure that a lot of the tourists that would normally come to that part of the country in the fall to see the leaves, to just hang out in the mountains, that they, they, they know they can come. I mean, there, there are roads that you can travel on, maybe not the main interstates that have been wiped away. But there are roads. I mean, I drove all the way into downtown Asheville, you know, and all the surrounding areas that I could get to. Um, so you can still get there. These towns are open for business. Again, there's shows happening, uh, hotels, food, you know, all kinds of local opportunities there that are still very much available. And, I, I, again, I think that what I was saying earlier is a concern that people will just avoid the area because you just don't know. But obviously check it out before you go. But. But um, but but still visit. I mean that that part of the country definitely relies on tourist dollars that that they just won't match this year, you know. But they still they still need that. So that's another way people can help uh, is just get in your car if you can, you know, still visit that part of that's beautiful there this time of year. Nothing like it, and uh, you know, spend some money, <laughs> spend some money on site. Uh, so anyway, my point is, is that, uh, I do that show in, in Boone, November 14th. Uh, and that's it. That's the last show that I'm going to play, at least that I know of at this point. So, um, and again, that's a good thing for me, uh, in my sense of balance of playing out and playing in town in Nashville. Uh, I look forward to being around the house. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. And, you know, I am going to hammer the point home again because we are looking for donations. People, if you've enjoyed this episode, um, and how could you not have enjoyed listening to Brian talk about all that? Please just donate <laughs> whatever you can, um, any small amount. And do spread the word. Send this episode to people. Share it. Let them know. Um, the I love having these kind of conversations. I feel so incredibly blessed. And this is sort of one of the reasons we're here this evening. I've been lucky enough to be totally welcomed in by the bluegrass community and these communities mm -hmm. are little towns in the hills but this community is also global and i've it has thrown its arms wide and welcomed me and i had you were saying before brian about being on stage at Melfest and having an emotional moment i had a very similar thing walking through the streets of raleigh the other week um, at ibma just seeing the street fair and seeing all this stuff that had come together and feeling mm -hmm. so overwhelmed that i had been somehow embraced by this world and it wanted me to be a yeah. part of it um and and that was the day after half of the street fair had had to close because of the weather and it was a minor inconvenience to us but it flattened some people's homes and it's ruined some people's lives and so every little bit of money people can donate for this episode is going to help with that and we will be eternally grateful for those of you that do well let me add to that you know just from a, as a person that's from there and felt all that even outside of just the the organization that is the IBMA and the, and the sort of logistic structure that they have created, what you still have around Asheville are these musicians and communities that gather and play music. And I, I saw pictures of, of downtown Marshall, North Carolina, that has where the, the, co the local coffee shop there has hosted a jam session for years, and it's totally wiped away. Um, but they're rebuilding, you know, and – what I'm trying to get to here is that idea of community. I was able to experience that as a kid. I was welcomed, in, wel welcomed into that world and supported to be able to do what I'm doing now. And it's that resilience. It's that that kind of common goal that, you know, especially kind of for mountain people, if you will. I mean, you might live an hour apart, but there's just there's something about that that connects. And again, I think in the world of bluegrass, there's obvious that that connection and so you're helping your own community when you give money to something like this, you know, and know that it's going to specific people and know that it's, it's helping very specific needs uh, that are very community based. And that was one of the things I saw the other day is still tents and water stations. And uh, when I say tents, I mean like stand in line and come under this tent and you'll get a free meal or a bottle or a, you know, a pallet of water, whatever it may be. Uh, and so, again, that's to our earlier point, too, that that is ongoing. That's not just going to stop, you know, some days in the next couple of weeks. There will be continued need uh, into, you know, months and months from now. Well, fingers crossed this raises a bit of money. There have been some extraordinary things going on. I've seen across sort of social media, people doing benefit concerts, people 
you yeah. know, people doing big things, people doing small things, and all of that stuff adds up. The big ticket stuff that you see that raises thousands and thousands of dollars is wonderful. But there are people doing little bits and pieces all over the place, giving their time, giving their attention, giving their money, giving whatever they can give. Um, and yeah. it's- Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. This was your idea, and I'm honored to be part of, of your efforts to, you know, to give back to this community. And it's really important, and I'm, I hopefully – I'm able to do that through this because I've got so much from this community and from you, Brian, through our conversations uh, on the podcast and artist works and just your general support as I've gone about this strange endeavor of making a podcast over the past few years. Um, so I thank you for that <laughs> yeah. as well, just on a personal level. But thanks for your sure. time today. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.